Good afternoon. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about the concept of adaptation in a couple of short lectures. The first one, actually, I would deal, or I want to deal with the concept or the question, why is adaptationism a flaw? First of all, let's talk about adaptation. What is it that we are talking about? And I think it's important to put this in context. First of all, use adaptation in a sense that you have heard before. Adaptation as the syndrome of physiological responses to environmental stress. That's what we have previously called the general adaptation syndrome of Hans Zeller. Well, that, could be, that is one definition for adaptation. We can also define adaptation as the alteration of a sensory or nervous response under constant stimulation. And this is something that all of you have experienced. For example, when moving from a dark room into a light room. When you move from a, light room, a dark room to a light room, your photoreceptors in the eye that had been adapted at the dark conditions they are overstimulated when you go into the light, but eventually, after a while, that stimulus is not the same. It changes. There are adjustments, and this is due to basically the adaptation of the sensory system. So these are two uses of the word adaptation that are a bit outside of the scope of this course. But I think it's important to bring them here because, well, you know, the adaptation as a word is used in different contexts, and we have to see in which context this is appropriate. Finally, I would say that adaptation can also be referred to as the functional change in an organism after exposure to new conditions of a new environment. And I think that this is what, how most of you would define the term adaptation. If we look at animals that are actually out in the wild, adjusting, acclimating, at different conditions at this, at the, this, as these conditions change a lot. In all these cases, we are dealing with the word adaptation in a physiological context, what I would call a physiological adaptation. But there is another understanding of the word adaptation. There is a more rich uh, concept of adaptation that has to do with Adaptation and as an evolutionary meaning, as an evolutionary meaning, that is an evolutionary adaptation, and that's basically something that already comes from Darwin's times. And in this case, adaptation and evolutionary adaptation refers to a trait or a set of traits in an individual in an organism that originated due to natural selection, because it improved the fitness of the individual possessing it or possessing. And I think that this is the richest concept of adaptation. We interpret, in this case, adaptation as an evolutionary happening, as a change in an organism that, has, that actually was shaped by natural selection and that improved fitness. Well, within this context, it's very important to make sure that we talk about the same thing. And that's why I want to discuss this question here. What is adaptationism then? Is adaptationism the same than adaptation? No. Adaptationism is, has been defined as a style of research in evolutionary biology in which, in evolutionary biology or any other science for that matter, in which all features of organisms are viewed a priori as optimal features produced by natural selection specifically for current function. There are lots of things in this definition that are different from the definition I gave earlier on adaptation. Optimal, current function are things that we need to look at. And adaptationism is something that came into science by the hands of many. But I think that there is two of them, two researchers that have been put as the proponents or the most exponents for adaptationism. And these, ha these are Edward Wilson and Richard Dawkins, who in the 70 1975 and 1976 published two very influential books. 
would say, two very good books. But they are very influential, and they were very influential in the way that they basically portrayed evolution. And I think that in a way that misled many people in the way they understood evolution. This adaptationistic state of mind, this is my wording, the adaptationistic state of mind that actually perhaps was seeded by these authors and others has been pervasive in many fields of research since the mid-70s. And I encourage you to look at uh, a YouTube uh, short clip, about two minutes, uh, done by Richard Dawkins. And then see basically if you can detect this adaptationistic way of thinking that I'm going to continue defining in this lecture. This is now an example of extreme adaptationism using the Panglossian paradigm. And the Panglossian paradigm refers to a novel written by Voltaire in the 19th, uh, 19th, what would be? Yeah, 19th century. No, the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century. Um, and when you read this, I'll read it for you, you see that it is basically ridiculous in the way it's written. I don't say that adaptationists will believe this, but they come close, and that's what I'll try to discuss in this lecture. What this text is basically describes uh, this in a very nice way. Uh, Pangloss was the preceptor, and now back in the old times, in this and this period, of course, children had tutors. They did not come. They did not go to schools. Well, only the rich children got educated, and they had tutors. And of course, or preceptors. And this was Dr. Pangloss, or Master Pangloss. He was the oracle of the family. And little Candy, this is the child that is learning, listened to his instructions with all the simplicity natural to his age and disposition. Master Pangloss taught the metaphysical theologo cosmonology, whatever that is. <coughs> he could prove to admiration that there is no effect without the cause and that in this best of all possible worlds, the Baron's castle was the most magnificent of all castles, and my lady the best of all possible baronesses. With this preamble, basically, you see the, the idea of optimality. But here it comes. This, the preceptor Master Panglo said, it is demonstrable that things cannot be otherwise than as they are. For as all things have been created for some end, they must necessarily be created for the best end. Observe, for instance, the nose is, former for, is formed for spectacles. Therefore, we wear spectacles. The legs are visibly designed for stockings. Accordingly, we wear stockings. Stones were made to be hewn and to construct castles. Therefore, my lord has a magnificent castle. For the greatest baron in the province ought to be, ought to be the best lo lodged. Swine were intended to be eaten. Therefore, we eat pork all the year round. And they who assert that everything is right do not express themselves correctly. They, would, they should say that everything is best. So this is uh, extreme magnification of the purpose for everything. There is a purpose for everything. And there is no room for improvement. Everything is optimal. Everything is best. How does this fit with adaptationism? Well, this is where things come together. This is a paper published in 1979 by Stephen Jay Gould, now deceased, and Richard Leventine from Harvard University. And they published this paper in 1979 called The Spandrels of San Marco and the Panglossian Paradigm, a critique of the adaptationist program. It is my opinion that no biologist should be able to graduate from a university without having read this paper. This is an extremely influential and important paper, actually a landmark paper in our understanding of the concept of adaptation. And you'll see why. Of course, you have to put it in a historical context. Things today are not the same that things were 30 years ago. But this was an extremely important paper. What are the main ideas of the Spandrels paper? The main idea of the Spandrels paper is 
actually they do, they, they take in the paper, it's a nice paper to read because you see passion. Most of you will think, well, scientists are rational people. This paper distills passion. A vicious critique to the adaptationist view under which all traits can be explained using a just-so story. They say plausible stories can always be told. A poignant and cynical vision on the argumentation style of the adaptationists. So what they are saying is that adaptationism is wrong. That, in other words, animals are not perfectly designed. Animals or plants or anything else that is out in this world is not for the best of purposes. And I think that, that that will not surprise any of you. Do you have studied evolution? And you understand, you understand that evolution does not drive anything to perfection. But it's very easy to fall in that trap. It is very easy. And what they say is that adaptation is basically, you know, keep finding adaptive arguments one at a time. If an argument fails, they assume that another one must exist. Because, of course, if we cannot explain this particular character in an animal because of this, there must be another reason that explains it. Because there always has to be a reason. If no arguments hold, you end up saying, well, we don't understand it properly. But of course, there must be a reason why this character is so. And finally, they emphasize immediate utility. The argumentation is always, oh, this is good for this reason, for this animal now. We've lost the perspective that this animal is what it is, based on thousands, million years of actually evolution. And all we seem to understand is that what we see now should have a meaning today. And of course, this is wrong, right? You will all agree with me that this is wrong. But then you would be surprised how many times we, your teachers, you yourselves, fall in this trap. What they end up in their paper is basically saying, always consider alternative explanations. Always look for other reasons. Don't be happy with the first one that seems to be okay. And they say that alternative, not necessarily adaptive explanations for the existence of a trait can always be found. And they give many examples. First of all, they say that a trait can be historically inherited, can be a neutral trait, and when I talk about trait, I mean almost any character. I mean, for example, uh, the concentration of hemoglobin in the blood. I mean for a, a given heart rate, baseline heart rate, or a, a, a given level of glucocorticoids after stress. Anything can be actually a trait in this sense. Mm -hmm. Neutral traits can be present in ancestors. They will not be selected against, therefore they are there. So the fact that you see something, some trait that can be physiological, but also structural in an animal, does not mean that it's there for a purpose. It can be a historical inheritance, something that was there, and it has not been lost. But it serves no purpose. It could be, and this is an interesting thing that we, I will discuss by the end, it could be that this trait that you see today is beneficial. But it may not have appeared for this purpose that it's used today. If it has not appeared for this purpose, it should not be called an adaptation. Instead, you can call it a pre-adaptation or an ex-adaptation. We'll, I'll get back to this later. There can be developmental patterns and constraints. Because no, uh, structures, particularly when looking at um, morphological structures, cannot appear de novo. They cannot appear out of nothing. Hmm? They need to be based on pre-existing structures. If you look at the mammalian lung as one example, the mammalian lung, the lung in mammals, is a suboptimal design. If you had to put an engineer to design a gas exchange structure, it would never create a sort of a pool like the lung is, where gas, where air is entering through one hole and coming out through the same hole. That is a suboptimal design. But this mammalian lung is actually the product of the first terrestrial vertebrates that came on land. That's the best they could do. What could they do? 
simply imaginate an area, a surface area, that was protected inside in terms of not losing too much water, that it could vascularize to capture, and that's it. So if you look at the lungs of amphibians or reptiles, you'll see that they are very simplified lungs. Our lung is much more sophisticated, much more compartmentalized, but it originated from that ancestral, ancestral lung. And there was no way to find another lung design anywhere. That was the lung design that was available. You had to work with the structure you had. Physical and biomechanical correlation. Why is blood red? Well, just because it's red. So what? Does it have to be a purpose? Does it have to, the fact that it's red it serves a purpose? Oh, because then if, if, if blood is red, then you see when you are injured. Okay, now all of a sudden that is very important. Uh, but then you can say, well, you see that you see red better, perhaps because then the eyes evolved to, to see better the red. So you can find lots of argumentations that will never hold up. Mm -hmm. I would say that blood is red simply because the pigments that actually are the core basis of hemoglobin is just red. Phenotypic correlations. There are lots of things that can be explained just based on body size. Nothing else. Genetic correlation. And here you go into some your knowledge of genetics, which is much better than the knowledge of genetics than Jay Gould, Stephen Jay Gould or Richard Levantin had in 1979. Because in 30 years or 30 something, a lot has happened. But we know that there are pleiotropic effects, right? Pleiotropy means essentially that different traits, different characters, have the same genetic basis. The same gene actually explains different characters. Or epistasis, different genes actually making up for a trait. Therefore, there is the potential for genes being selected for one reason, and then they are carried along. Therefore, they remain. There's no natural selection. It's simply that that's what, what's, what's there. And finally, you have chance fixation of allelic variants in small populations due genet to genetic drift. If you start with a very small population, some alleles that may not be optimal will be fixed just because there is nothing else. So there are lots of reasons, lots of alternatives, why adaptation should not always be for the best of purposes and why we should not always look for adaptations everywhere. The root of adaptationism is panselectionism. Panselectionism means that you believe that natural selection is the only cause of natural variation, of that basically evolution is driven only by natural variation. And what's interesting about this is that Darwin already in his first edition of the origin of the species, species make a point, made a point about this. Darwin was a pluralist. He admitted mechanisms other than natural selection. It just seems that someone else alone forgot that. You can read this, but basically he wrote in, this is actually a, a chunk of the 1872, the sixth version of, or the sixth edition of the Origin of the Species from 1872. And then basically in the conclusions, he writes what he already wrote in the introduction. I am convinced that natural selection has been the main but not the exclusive means of modification. And then he says, this has been to, of no avail. Great is the power of mi steady misinterpretation. Already in 1872, he acknowledged the existence of adaptationism. He acknowledges the existence of people that believe that the only drive for evolution is natural selection. Actually, this is what he wrote in the introduction in the first edition of The Origin of the Species. He finished it with that. I am convinced that natural selection has been the main but not the exclusive means of modification. Well, it seems that this sentence got lost for many. Now, the question is, am I making, I'm making adaptationism a bad thing? Is it so bad? I think that Dawkins himself, Richard Dawkins himself, will say that even if adaptationism might seem bad, it has been an extremely fruitful, it has been an extremely fruitful uh, field of research and has helped a lot in the, our progress. Mm -hmm. He says, I think that all evolutionists are agreed upon that it is virtually impossible to do a better job than an organism is doing in its own environment. Fair enough. Fair enough. But that does not mean that everything has a purpose. Mm 
Adaptationism can have virtues as well as faults. Adaptationism as a working hypothesis, almost as a faith, has undoubtedly been the inspiration for some outstanding discoveries. Adaptationist thinking, if not blind conviction, has been a valuable stimulator of testable hypotheses in physiology. And there I do not agree so much with him. Because I think that adaptationism is pervasive. Many fields of research have not progressed at the rate they could have if we had lost the adaptationist thinking. In my eyes, behavior ethology is the one where this is still more pervasive. And even in physiology, this has been a very pervasive idea <coughs> with adaptationism. My conclusions, and this is how I would like to finish. First, adaptation as a physiological term is useful and necessary. The general adaptation syndrome, why should we change that? It has historical reasons. Let's not touch it. Adaptation as the alteration of a sensory or nervous response, perfect definition, don't touch it. Hmm? Adaptation as the functional change in an organism after exposure to new conditions or a new environment. I would say, let's not use the term adaptation for this. Let's use the term acclimation, or let's use the term acclimatization. Acclimation is the situation where an animal adjusts to a new environment in controlled conditions in the laboratory. Acclimatization is when this occurs in the outside world. So I think that when we look at changes that an animal has experienced based on the change in environmental conditions, let's call that acclimation. Let's call that acclimatization. And then we reserve the word adaptation for something that has a better purpose. Adaptation as an evolutionary term, useful and necessary in the following scenarios. Adaptation as the trait or set of traits that originated due to natural selection. Adaptation as the process of improvement of fitness in a population as a result of natural selection. Fine. Adaptation is a pre-existing trait beneficial to an organism in a particular environment or circumstance. I think that this is generally accepted as adaptation, but I would say that it's probably better to use the term pre-adaptation or exaptation. Because in this case, the trait did not appear for its current benefit. It appeared for another reason, and then it has been used later on. And meaning is important when we are discussing the concept of adaptation. Finally, let me finish with an anecdote. When I started discussing this with my students already 10 years ago, all I managed to do was scare them so much that they would not dare to use the word adaptation. That was not my intention. And this is essentially wrong. Of course, the word adaptation should be used. But use it for its actual purpose, with understanding of what it means. Not as an easy word, like we use the word stress, for example. That would be, yeah, in any case, avoid just so stories and consider alternatives and run the experiments. And that should be the end. Thank you very much.